hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Knitting Pickle podcast. My name is Laura and I'm a knitter. I live in the UK in the Midlands and I make knitting podcasts. I can't quite believe we're at episode 10. I don't know why, but it feels like a big deal for me. Um, when I was younger, when we turned 10, it was like a big deal, like you're 10 years old, double figures, woo! And I was telling my husband about this the other day and he was like, there's nothing special about 10. You know, what are you talking about? So I don't know if it's just me, but yay, episode 10. If you haven't seen one of my videos before, hello and welcome. I would love it if you joined the family. And if you are a returning viewer, then I'm ever so, ever so grateful to have you back. Speaking of which, in the past week or two, we hit 5k subscribers. Yay! I can't, I can't quite believe it. It's mad. First of all, it blows my mind that, that there are that many knitters out there anyway, because like, even though it's like a big thing on the internet, you don't actually meet them in real life very often. I think I've spoken about that before. But it blows my mind that over 5,000 of you want to hear what I've got to say. So thank you for being part of the family. Honestly, I really, really appreciate it. It's one of my favorite things to do. I have, I was not able to film last week. I was supposed to do a podcast last week, but I wasn't able to. We'll go into that a bit more later. But I missed it so much. And I've been looking forward to this day for ages. Sitting down, chatting with you guys, going through my whips. I feel a bit out of breath. <laughs> I feel a bit out of practice as well. Um, normally I do the nitty chat at the end of an episode, but it's been quite an odd few weeks. So I'm just going to kind of cover that a little bit first just to kind of catch you up on where I am, how I've been feeling, what's been going on. So as I said, last week would have been a podcasting week. I aim to do a podcast every two weeks, but you know, it's flexible. Life gets in the way sometimes. Sometimes I'll have a really productive few weeks, sometimes a less productive few weeks, which has happened this past few weeks. How many times can I say weeks? <laughs> um, so yeah, I was supposed to film last week. Um, and in the morning on the Wednesday, both I've got two young children, by the way, and they both go to nursery on a Wednesday. Um, so last Wednesday, I was like, right, I need to film a podcast today. But I just wasn't really feeling it. And I now know why I wasn't feeling it. So I decided not to film a podcast last week. And instead, I organised my yarn stash and all my knitting stuff. I've got a big um, shelving unit in our office slash spare room. And it was a complete mess, so I decided to sort that out instead. And I did film it, and I thought, I can't do a podcast, but I could at least put this kind of little mini bonus episode out. And I was editing it, <laughs> and I got really bored. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my God, if I'm finding this so boring to edit, then I can imagine it's gonna be pretty boring to watch. So I just kind of decided to not finish that video. Um, but I do still have the footage and I've still got like the bit at the end where I show the finished kind of storage area. So if you're interested in seeing that little bit and how I store all my knitting supplies, let me know in the comments below and I'll add it to the end of the next episode. It's kind of like a little bonus feature type thing. And so anyway, I wasn't feeling it that day and we later on that day I realised why I wasn't feeling it and it was because I wasn't feeling very well. Um, I won't go into too many details but basically my whole family came down with a, oh my god, an awful, awful sickness bug which we've now sourced back to my husband's work. We thought it might have been nursery but obviously we called the nursery and let them know but they said they'd had no other reported cases. Hopefully my kids didn't pass it on to anybody else. But we now know it came from my husband's work and that night we all got really poorly. My husband actually felt poorly but didn't have any symptoms, but me and the two kids, it was a horrific night. I'm not going to go into any more details and it, I was affected the worst, I think, and it knocked me for six for days it took me days and days and days to recover and unfortunately this was all two days before my son's fourth birthday poor lad it was such a shame we had to cancel his party because um we had a few incidences over the next few days and you're not supposed to really come into contact with people for 48 hours afterwards because in case you pass the bug on and you know 
all of his little cousins were supposed to come round and I didn't want to pass that on to them so we had to cancel his little birthday party. We didn't even go anywhere on his actual birthday but you know he's four years old, all he cared about was that he got to stay at home with daddy all day and play Lego so he was happy and we're going to have another little birthday party for him this coming weekend and it worked out quite well actually because last week my mum couldn't make it but this week she can so we're going to have an even bigger party for him so that is why we didn't get an episode last week and also why I have made some decisions in the past week when it comes to knitting what I'm knitting what I'm not knitting I'll stop beating around the bush and basically I've lost my mojo it's gone when I felt poorly, obviously I couldn't knit. I tried to knit, but doing anything that involved concentration or anything like that, it just made me feel so awful. So I didn't knit for a few days. And since then, it's just gone. It's just gone. I don't really feel inspired by any of my projects. Well, okay, I didn't. <laughs> I think it's starting to come back now and I'll show you and tell you about some of the things I've been doing to get my mojo back. Cause that's something that we talk about, well, I hear people talking about quite a lot. How do you get your knitting mojo back? And instead of going into it now, I'll, I'll talk about it throughout the episode. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's been a strange couple of weeks and I don't, <laughs> I don't really know how this podcast is going to go. I've got some finished objects. I've got quite a few whips and I do also have some acquisitions. Um, so I suppose we should probably get on with it and I'll stop rambling now. That was a long introduction, wasn't it? Let's start with what I'm wearing. It might not be knitted, but it is knitting related. I'm pretty sure you can see it in the shot. Um, but it is my new t-shirt and it says, choose wool. Um, I'm imagining knowing the demographic of the people who watch my videos. Most of you will get the reference, but if you don't, um, back in the eighties, um, George Michael and Wham, wore t-shirts that said choose life and it's a play on that um but it says choose wool because wool is the best it's from wool bath which is a yarn shop in bath <laughs> um in england i bought it online i do kind of live i live about an hour from bath and it's my favorite city in the whole entire world well i mean apart from maybe paris but in england it's my favorite city I went there on my Hindu as a surprise and my sister arranged my Hindu and I'd never been before and I fell in love with the city and then when I was pregnant with my daughter my husband had to go on a business trip for like two weeks so I took my son who was about one and a half at the time on a little mummy and son holiday to Bath. Oh what is that? I think that was plough. I took my son on a little mummy and son holiday to Bath. We stayed in Airbnb, we went to Bath Farm and just did a little tour of the city. So I really, really love it there. And I cannot wait to actually go to Woolbath one day. But when my corner set sock pattern went live, I treated myself to this t-shirt as a little kind of well done present along with quite a bit of yarn, but we won't go into that. Um, and it arrived the other day. Um, I got a message from Laura who runs Woolbath and they'd actually went out the size that I wanted. So she asked me if I wanted a different size or a refund or if I wanted to wait until the restock. So I just said, I'll happily wait. <clears throat> I'd rather have a t-shirt that fits me and that I'm gonna wear a lot. So I waited and the other day it arrived and along with it, <sighs> Laura sent me a little mini skein saying thank you for waiting, which she didn't need to do. Um, but obviously it's always very, very nice. Um, I didn't realize that Woolbath and Dye Bath were the same people. I knew that Woolbath stocked Dye Bath, but I didn't realize that Laura was actually the person behind Dye Bath. And I learned that from um, Jonathan Day, his latest podcast. He actually went to Woolbath. So jealous. And he was talking about it then. So she sent me this lovely little mini scheme. It's the Delhi Sock Base. It doesn't tell me what the percentages are, but because it's a sock, I'm assuming there's nylon or polyamide in it or something. It's a 20 grams and it's a one of a kind um, colorway called Sunset. So I'm sure this will be appearing in some um, socks in the future. So thank you, Laura. Don't think you watch, but I'll talk to you like you are. So, right. 
We'll start with the finished objects. And with the first finished object, I've also got another little story to go alongside that. Um, after I filmed the last podcast, it was my sister's birthday. I made her a magnolia bloom, which I've shown you before. Um, and for her birthday, we surprised her. So, and by we, I mean me and my mum. We surprised her with a little trip to the Cotswolds. I live right next to the Cotswolds, not actually in it, but it's right on our doorstep. And I'm about a 20 minute drive from all the lovely, beautiful Cotswold villages. So we took her to Broadway, which is one of my favourites. It's absolutely stunning. It's got like a big, long kind of high street and loads of little shops. And in it, there's this teeny, tiny little yarn shop. And by tiny, I mean tiny. You can get two, three people in there comfortably, but it is stocked floor to ceiling with yarn. It's incredible. It's run by a lady called Sue, and I think it's called So You Can Knit. Um, and that was kind of like the, the main event of the day was going to visit this yarn shop but because of lockdown, like, um, and there not being that many local yarn shops other than like hobby craft. Um, me and my mum and my sister didn't really have never really been to a proper yarn shop together, if at all. My sister is a crocheter, by the way. My mum is a crocheter. Neither of them knit, but I'm hoping to change that. Um, but obviously they equally love the yarn as much as I do. So we went to this little shop and then we also went to have afternoon tea at the Broadway Hotel and it was stunning. Oh my gosh, it was the best afternoon tea I've ever had. If you're not sure what an afternoon tea is here in England, it's basically tea and sandwiches and cake. And it usually comes in like a little stand. You don't have to have tea. I had coffee, but you'll get a selection of sandwiches and a selection of cakes. And it all looked really lovely, but every time we tried something new, it just like tasted incredible. There was like this one like plain looking little bit of cake, but it was like the most delicious lemon drizzle cake you ever had in your life. And there was there, like a meringue looking thing. I thought, oh yeah, it's just a meringue, but it was like soft and chewy and oh, I've gone off on a massive tangent here. But yeah, that's what we did for my sister's birthday. And whilst we were in this little yarn shop, um, I did buy two different things, one of which I'll show you later, one of which I'll show you now because I've actually used it. I picked up some local Cotswold yarn. I um, was really excited when I saw it. There were actually two types of yarn, local yarn in the shop, um, but one of them, I wasn't really into the colour and I also didn't want to like buy loads of it not knowing what it was like. And I think I mentioned in the last podcast that I've been wanting to knit a pair of white, thick, ribbed house socks in the style of Rachel from Friends season two. <laughs> and I saw this yarn and they had it in Fingering, DK and Aaron. And it is the Totally Cotswold, Totally Cotswold Knitwear Aaron. I kept the, kept the little label and it is wool and spun natural fleece colour, 100% wool. So I bought two skeins of it in the Aran weight, thinking that I can use a skein for each sock. And that's what I did. And here they are. Now, you might not be able to tell, but they're actually different. <laughs> this was a, a, a pattern that I just made up as I went along. Not that difficult to create a ribbed sock. It's pretty simple. If you know how to knit a sock, you can knit a rib sock. Um, but the only difference I did this time was I went toe up. I thought, mix it up a little bit. And the reason I did toe up was because I wanted to use one skein per sock. So starting at the toe, I knew that I could just knit and knit and knit the leg until I ran out of yarn. Now that happened a little quicker than I thought it would. I did have ideas of like quite a long leg so that I could squish it down and bunch it up. Um, or fold it over like I have, but what I've kind of ended up with is more of like a booty than a sock, or the sock I had in mind anyway, and I'll do a little cutaway of me wearing them. And so yeah, they're both a little bit different and I'll tell you how they're different. Um, the first difference is the heel placement. I did a short row heel. Um, I did, I, I kind of wanted to do a flap and gusset and there is a way you can do a flap and gusset toe up but it looked complicated and I wanted something simple so I decided to do a short row heel I don't have the best relationship with short row heels because I always find there's a little gap between my German short rows which I don't particularly like and so the, this is the first one I did 
and you might be able to see that where the kind of knit it's two by two rib by the way where the knit column comes up the heel kind of comes between those two knit stitches and comes out of there and it just kind of looked a bit messy to me so on the second sock I changed it so that the um, heel is in the purl section, not halfway through the knit section. Just so you've got that nice solid knit column going all the way up. And I think it looks much better. And the other subtle difference is the cast off method. Now, normally I'm always casting off like one by one rib. <clears throat> Motorbike. Normally when I'm casting off, it's either like stockinette or one by one rib, so I'll do a tubular cast off. Um, but obviously this is two by two. So the first one that I did, I just did the, it was a stretchy bind off method that I watched on a, I think it was a very pink tutorial where basically you kind of knit two together and then pop the stitch back on the left needle and then knit two together, pop it back on the needle and you do it in patterns. So you, sometimes you knit, sometimes you pull. And it creates a really, really stretchy um, bind off, which is what you want in this case. But I don't particularly like the look of it, especially when it's folded over. It just kind of just looks a bit messy and a bit chunky and it just wasn't my favourite. So I thought for the second sock, I'll try a different bind off method. Um, so I looked into whether I could do a tubular bind off for two by two rib. And the only way I found to do it, I found a few tutorials, but in the end I watched the Andrea Mallory version. And you basically have to convert your two by two rib to one by one rib. And to do that, you basically switch two stitches around. So you're effectively doing a little cable so that you end up with one by one rib and then you do an Italian or a tubular sewn bind off as you normally would. And again, it's all right, it's super stretchy, but I'm not so thrilled with the finish because those those nice columns that we've created, they kind of go off a bit wonky and a bit skewed at the end. So it's not as perfect as I want and I've decided that if I am to knit these again, which I think I will because I put quite a lot of effort into these and I'd like them to be something that I can, you know, create, release, share with you guys maybe, I've decided that what I need to do is go cuff down because that way I can do a really beautiful, invisible Italian tubular, Italian tubular cast on. Oh my God, my brain. I can do a really beautiful cast on. And then, so when we do the folding over, it would look like beautiful, like super beautiful. I'm definitely a bit of a perfectionist. Like both of these cast offs are absolutely fine. And let's, Get real, it's a pair of socks on your feet that probably no one's gonna see because these are definitely indoor socks. Maybe welly socks or boot socks, um, but no one's gonna walk up to you and be like, mm, the edge of your sock's not that neat, is it? So, you know, I'm just trying to not be too extra with myself. But I also know that if there's a way I can do it that's perfect, that's how I'm gonna wanna do it. So I am hoping to re-knit these at some point. However, I need to do a different yarn. This yarn is super, super rustic. It's like lopy rustic. It's like full on 100% rustic. And when I pop it like on my arm, it's fine. Like I would wear this as a jumper with like maybe a t-shirt underneath in the cold, cold winter, no problem. But on the feet, on my naked soft feet, oh my gosh, it's too itchy even for me. It feels like spiky, it feels like stingy almost. So I definitely didn't choose the right yarn. Now I don't want to kind of like say that it's the yarn's fault because it's not the yarn's fault. It is what it is. It's 100% wool, it's rustic. That's the way it is. It's just, for me, it's a step too far to wear on the feet. However, what I was thinking is you know when it's like really cold in the winter and you need to wear wellies, like I've got walking boots, but sometimes if there's gonna be like big puddles, I want wellies and wellies aren't very warm. So I usually end up wearing a couple of really thick pairs of socks. So I can imagine in the winter, a pair of normal socks and then these as almost like over socks to keep my feet nice and cozy warm in my wellies. So, there you go. I don't know if I'm actually going to wear these or not, but I do quite like the way they look sat 
on my knitting shelves. I think maybe if I was to get a pair of really nice like wooden sock blockers, they'd look really nice like hanging up maybe, we'll see. But anyway, so yes, those are my socks. They don't have a name. I wanted to call them the Rachel socks, obviously, but that's already a thing, unfortunately. So I don't know if these will get a name. If I continue with this pattern, I'll find a name. Anyway, so that's my first finished object. My second finished object is kind of transitional between FO and WHIP because I have one finished and I've cast on another. Um, this one is super, super exciting. It, oh, I have finished my colour work jumper. This was a WHIP in the last episode and I was talking about how I wasn't sure if I should rip it back and start again or not because throughout the process of writing the pattern I realised that my stitch count wasn't quite right for the one I'd made before so I did in the end end up ripping it all back well not all I ripped it back to here and um, because the the cast on and the neck was all going to still be the same but I ripped it back and started it again based on the maths that I figured out whilst grading and it's perfect this is my daughter's size, so it's size two to one to two, two to four. I think this is size, yeah, two to four. My daughter's quite mini. Um, I haven't got any footage of her wearing it because she's refusing. <laughs> I don't know why. She wears all the other things I knit for her, but she's, she's outright saying no, she will not wear it. I tricked her into wearing it and then she pulled it straight off again. So I've not got any footage for you, but I'll obviously do a close-up. I'm so proud of it. I absolutely love it. Like, oh my God, I can't, I, like, I look at it and I can't quite believe it came out of my brain. I don't know if that's like, you know, what's the word? Immodest? Not too sure, but I'm really proud of it. So I'm gonna own that. Um, I use the Phil Kalana Panilla for this. Panilla, I think it's Panilla like vanilla, not Panilla like tortilla. Which is it? <laughs> um, I think it's Panilla and in the shade Chinese Red and Off-White. And I actually realised when I finished the pattern that this does not meet gauge. <laughs> this yarn is too fine. So it's a little bit smaller than the pattern um, than it would be if I'd actually got the gauge. But that doesn't really matter to me because it's just my sample. And again, my daughter's quite mini, so this will fit her for a little while. If not, this is just going to be like hanging up with my knitting stuff so I can look at it forever because it's like it's like the first one, it's the first jumper. This version has the kind of balloon puffy sleeve which basically means there's no decreases along the sleeves and at the end I do a fast decrease to reduce down to like a cuff so you get this kind of cute little puffy guy. I didn't want it to be like a big balloon sleeve because that's quite impractical for children um, but I do like how I think it looks slightly more feminine and then I like how a um, fitted sleeve can look a little bit more masculine. Obviously the two are completely interchangeable um, and it completely depends on your preference, but I wanted to be able to provide instructions for both. So whichever you prefer, you could do. So the pattern itself has the puff sleeve and the fitted sleeve. And yeah, that's where we are. It has a name and it was named by one of my viewers. And it actually turns out that the person that named it, I've actually been chatting to on Instagram before, um, and it's the lovely Daniela, and she offered to translate my corner set sock pattern to Italian. Um, so I need to get in touch with you about that, Daniela, and get that sorted. But she suggested a name, and the moment I saw it, it was like, boom, that's the one. Um, so loads and loads of you suggested names, and I thought it was really, really interesting how different people interpreted it. And a lot of people kind of went down the same kind of track and there were a few kind of curveballs in there. A lot of people said it reminded them of piano keys, which is something that had popped into my mind when I was making it. I thought if this was like black and white, it would really look like piano keys. So I entertained the idea of a name along that vein. Um, I actually know how to play piano. I learned to play piano growing up um, and I always really liked the word arpeggio, it means like quick. So I thought the arpeggio sweater, that might be quite nice. But then I thought, well, it kind of, it relies on that name. If it was black and white, it would look like piano keys. And I didn't want to have a name that was like 
completely dependent on the colour. The other idea I had was it reminded me of like a circus tent, like a big top. But again, that was more in reference to the red and white. If it was in like green and white, it wouldn't look anything like a circus tent. So I didn't want to rely on that kind of reference. The thing that you guys said most of all was that it looked like a, um, like a firework or a sparkler or like a sunbeam or a starburst. And I think you're all right. I think that's what it kind of calls to the most. Daniela suggested the name Spark or Sparks. I can't remember which one it was. And I really, really liked it. It was like to the point. It was like, um, it conjures up a lot of imagery. And I think it really, really makes sense. However, I'm going to change it slightly. And this version is going to be called Little Sparks. Because it's the little child's version, I thought it would be really, really sweet if this was called Little Sparks and the adult version was called Sparks. So you've got like big sparks, little sparks. And then if I ever did like a kind of baby version, maybe I could do like a romper or something, you could call it Baby Sparks. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. This is the Little Sparks jumper. The pattern is finished, um, but I'm currently in that I'm too scared to send it to a tech editor phase. <laughs> which happened with the um, corner set socks. Um, but I basically just need to sit down and read through the pattern one more time just to make sure it's ready to send off. And I've got a, um, a tech editor lined up. So it's all ready to go. I just need to do it. But I'm like, ah! So carrying on from that FO, I'm going to go into my first whip. And I wonder if you can guess what it is. Say hello to the sparks. It's obviously it's not finished yet. And if you follow me on Instagram, this has gone through. This is the second version of this that I've done because the first one wasn't quite right. It's that way around. So here you go. Here is the adult version in all its glory. Well, not all of its glory, in about half its glory. But you get the idea. Isn't it nice? I'm so, so pleased with this. There are some differences between the... Um, big version and the little version. The first difference is the yarn I used. Realising that I didn't get gauged with the panilla, I had a panilla, Laura! Realising that I didn't get gauged with that yarn, I went on a hunt for another yarn and um, the gauge for this is 21 stitches, which I have now realised is more of like a light worsted, heavy DK. Um, so I was having a little look on the old knit.co.uk and up came the Sandez Double Sunday, which is the Petite Knit yarn. Have I got any anywhere? No. So it's the Petite Knit. She does the Sunday, which is like a four ply, and then the Double Sunday, which is like a DK slash kind of worsted. And on the website, that said it came with 21 stitches per 10 centimetres. So I thought, perfect. I've wanted to try that for a while. I'm going to order it and see how we get on. And it, the gauge is bang on. Um, I didn't realise, however, when I was ordering it, that it's a superwash merino. I knew it was merino, but I didn't know it was superwash. And my last experience of superwash was the Cascade 220. And I tried to do a colourwork jumper in it, but I just did not get along with it at all. It felt waxy and it felt just, I didn't like the feel of it. And I was pleasantly surprised that that's not the case with this yarn. It's definitely, you, you can tell that it's superwash, but it's got a much kind of, more matte feel to it and i'm sorry but if it's good enough for petite knit then it's good enough for little old me so there we go that's the yarn i used the second difference is i decided to do a rolled hem hem rolled neckline um just because i mean it's stunning first of all and i also thought because the yoke is a two by two color work it's spongy and it's quite thick so it's basically like a double layer so to go from like a a thin flat neck band to the thicker yoke and then back to the thinner stockinette might be a bit, mm, I don't know, I wasn't too sure. So I thought if I do a folded neckline, then it's a smoother transition. You've got the, the neck band is basically the same thickness as the yoke. Um, I have done short rows in this guy. Actually, no, I'm not going to go into that yet. I'm going to talk about the yoke for a little bit longer. The first version of the yoke I had to rip back because it was puckering at the front. So where it sits across your chest here, it was like folding up like this. And that's because I didn't increase quick enough so that the, so the kind of shoulder span wasn't wide enough. So it was 
pulling like this and creating that kind of folded look. So I ripped all that back and then increased a lot quicker. The, the colour work itself, like where the extra lines come in, that's where the increases are. So you can see on the kids one, this kind of section here is a little bit longer. It's kind of a bit more equal. Whereas on the adult version, you get a lot more of this kind of second section. And that's because those initial increases need to happen a lot quicker. And because it's on a kid's yoke, it kind of, it all worked out having those increases equal. It still fits fine. And I think for the bigger children's sizes, because this is going to go up to about 10 years, I think, because I think um, once you get past 10 years, you can kind of get away with wearing like an adult extra small. And the adult version is going to go from like maybe even extra, extra small all the way up to 5XL. So I think inclusivity is super, super important to me. It might mean that the process takes a bit longer. And I know that finding test niches for those higher sizes can be quite difficult. But I don't think that's an excuse. We're going to do it. We're going to be size inclusive. So I think the, the kid size will go from like one year to 10 years and then you should be able to go into the adult sizes. Um, so yeah, I ripped the yoke back and started again and I'm really, really pleased because I actually feel like this bit where the, the colour work comes in at the bottom, that's the most interesting bit and the balance of the colour work didn't look quite right and physically it wasn't working either. So now you get a little bit less of this white and a bit more of this striking pink. Um, I have split and oh yes, I did some short rows in the back underneath the colour work to raise the neckline. You could quite easily put short rows in here before you start the colour work, but for me personally, just as an aesthetic, I don't like when you have that gap of white stocking it before colour work starts. And um, because of the nature of this design, how it kind of all bursts out from the neck, I didn't want to interrupt that. Um, I'm now thinking in hindsight, I probably can put short rows in whilst maintaining that one by one colour work. And I might give that a try just because working short rows at the top is a bit quicker because you only need to do a small section. Whereas working short rows at the bottom, at the back, they have to be much wider. They basically come all the way to the shoulder and then they're just, you're going back and forth over a lot more stitches to kind of make that little hump at the back. Um, so aesthetically it's better, but actually the knitting experience, it's not as fun. And I, if I can, I want to find a sweet spot in my patterns between them being um, aesthetically um, perfect, <laughs> but also enjoyable to knit. That's quite important to me. I don't ever want my patterns to be like a slog. And I know every knitter is different. For some people having really crazy intricate, 10 strand colour work like really tickles their pickle but for most people it doesn't so keeping things enjoyable is important to me I have started a sleeve I say started this is the second time I've done this sleeve honestly I've, I've basically knit this twice overall um the, I've decided to do the fitted sleeves for this one just because I kind of wanted just a, a kind of slightly closer fit not much positive ease um garment just in this case. So I decided to do the um, decreased sleeves. There will also be like a balloon sleeve instruction in the pattern because I mean, it's really simple. You just knit and then decrease and then boom. And the first time I did these decreases, I kind of, I didn't start soon enough. So to create the fitted sleeve, normally you'd have um, the same width sleeves going all the way down to around the elbow and then obviously your natural arm starts to taper off so that's where your decreases are basically along here you also want to make sure you have a bit of room so you can move your elbow if it's a bit too tight there it might be a bit uncomfortable however i found that instead of getting a nice kind of straight sleeve i had a really baggy sleeve here and then it kind of went whoop in and it started to get fitted here and i really really didn't like the look of it my decreases were too close together and this section was too big. So I ripped back to about halfway down the arm and then I started the decreases sooner, but they're a little bit more spaced apart. So you don't kind of have a really obvious, you know, tapering and you still have a bit more room around the elbow. I might just pop this on for you actually whilst we're here. So you can see how it's <laughs> looking. Is that the right way around? Yeah. Okay. So I can actually see my reflection in the telly. 
Oh yes, I forgot to say, we're in a different spot today. Um, I was in the mood to be cosy, if I'm honest, and I just wanted to snuggle up on the sofa with this blanket in the sunlight from the windows. And I've got a new plant baby and I wanted to show it off. Anyway, so this is how we are looking. Forgive me for looking over there. I just want to make sure that I can, it's fitting all right. And I'm so, so pleased with the fit. I think it sits really nicely on the body. It's not too big, it's not too tight. And you can see how my decreases are, the de I mean, my stitch markers are here, but the decreases are actually along here on the inner arm. And so you can see how you've got a bit of room around here, but it's starting to come in now. And we'll continue to decrease down to about here, and then we'll have a nice cut. So yeah, and I'm really, really enjoying this colour combination. This is whipped cream and dusty rose, I'm pretty sure. And you mean, can't really go wrong with pink, can you? So yeah, there you go. That's my adult Sparks sweater. I majorly lost my mojo on this one. Um, I think because I basically knit two of these and then I ended up having to knit this twice. I was just like, whoa, just needed a, a break from it really. And was just, just not feeling it and I didn't want to oh my gosh I didn't want to kind of like start having to like plow through it because then I'm going to stop enjoying the project and especially when it's like your own design you don't want that you don't want to be like plowing through your own project so this has been sitting down for a little while and I'm glad I did because looking at it again now and trying it on again I'm excited about it again and I reckon I'll pick this up again soon that's another reason why I wanted to podcast today was in an attempt to get that knitting mojo back a little bit. Um, I often find that when I podcast, it helps me make decisions about my projects when I'm a bit unsure. If I don't know whether to rip back or not, if I don't know whether to completely start again, if I know if I can decide whether to work on something or not at all. When I'm talking about them, I either get excited about them again or I know in my head I'm not picking this up again. So I know not everyone has got a podcast <laughs> and if you're in that knitting rut, you can't just like sit there and, well, I mean, you could, you could, there you go. If you've lost your knitting mojo, start a podcast. Or you could just maybe call up a knitting friend or organise a Zoom and sit and talk about your projects and discuss them with people because that process of discussing it can really help you make decisions on what is really giving you joy, what's making you excited and what isn't. So moving on, the next crib. This was cast on in an attempt to kind of um, zhuzh my mojo, bring back my mojo. I'm gonna have a little drink. I'm having a carbonated beverage today. I had a coffee earlier and it didn't make me feel that great. Um, I don't know why, but since we all got poorly last week, I'm just not feeling the coffee. And the only time this ever happened before is when I was pregnant. I'm definitely not pregnant, but I always go off coffee when I'm pregnant. And I know it will come back, but right now I'm just like, it's not really the one. So my next um, whip was an attempt to um, kind of bring back my knitting mojo. Another thing I find when you're losing your mojo is to just cast on something brand new, forget about everything else, put them in a bag, put them away, don't leave them sitting on the side where you can see them, you feel guilty, I should be working on this, I should be working on that. Put them away and start something new that, sh that would light your fire. If some there's something you've had your eye on for a while, if you've got some yarn and stash that you've wanted to cast on, that you've been waiting, just start something new. So that's what I did and it didn't necessarily work this time around and I now realise why, it's because I basically cast on what I was already working on. Um, I cast on another jumper, what's well, cardigan actually. Oh. And where I wasn't getting joy from my current jumper whip, I still wasn't getting joy from a new jumper whip that wasn't offering me anything different. However, I have made a decent amount of progress on it and it's something brand new, so I'm excited to show you. We're the right, right way around. I'm gonna talk a little bit about where the yarn came from first. I didn't realize, but Woolbath also have a D-stash page. And this isn't just like 
any random knitted de-stash page. This is a yarn shop de-stash page, so you can grab yourself one hell of a bargain. And I was having a little look through and I saw this stuff. This is the Berger de France, Doucelin, I think, or Doucelaine. I think it's probably Doucelin. Well, I mean, that might just be my pretend French. <laughs> but basically, it's an acrylic, it's an acrylic, <laughs> It's an Aran weight yarn. It's 80% wool and 20% polyamide. Now, Berger de France, their acrylic and man-made fiber wool blends are fantastic. That's what you're looking for. If you're in the market and you want a little bit of that man-made fiber content, if you're doing kid stuff, their ideal DK, it's wool and I think acrylic or nylon or something. I'm not sure which. Um, but I use that a lot when I started knitting and it's so so good it's got no squeaky feeling but it's not too rustic either and that's what you get with this even though the wool percentage is high that 20 percent polyamide kind of just gives it a smoothness and a softness that you don't get with don't necessarily get with 100 percent wool and i'm really really pleased it's in quite a dark color the color is called melissa and i think if i was just like generally yarn shopping i probably wouldn't have chosen this but this was one pound a ball, and there were nine balls available. So I got nine balls, they're 50 gram balls, and they are, how much do you get? You get 90 meters, 98 yards. So I did a little bit of maths, and I had a little, 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 little. <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of outtakes today. Um, I had a little look on the on Ravelry for some inspiration and first I looked at Aran weight patterns but I couldn't find anything that was kind of giving me the feel so I thought hang on a tiny wee minute I still got some of this left over from my Magnolia Bloom this is the Drops Kid Silk in the, it's number 10 I believe it's just called grey I think um, and I had two balls of this left in my stash. So I thought, hang on, if I put these together, we pretty much get chunky weight. Um, so I started having a little look. And on my Ravelry and my favourites, I organised my uh, like saved favourites into like Aaron, chunky, kids, just for me, farewell, that kind of thing. And in the chunky section was the Petite Knit Sunday Cardigan. Ta -da! And I think it might have been because the picture in the pattern is in like a kind of mid to dark mild gray color i thought oh yes that looks really really nice and i know that what i've got is going to create something really really similar and i had enough yardage and i thought i haven't done a petite knit pattern for ages i've done a sunday tea before and that was for my mother-in-law and i'm thinking about asking for it back because i've never seen her wear it but i really enjoyed that pattern though because it's four ply and on three millimeter needles, it took ages, even though it was a um, t-shirt. So I thought this is on seven millimeter needles. So I thought, well, okay, this is gonna be a bit quicker. Maybe I'm a bit bored of the Sparks jumpers because they are on four millimeter needles and it's taken me quite a while. So I thought, okay, well, let's cast on something chunky. But it didn't light my fire in the end. However, I'm enjoying the project overall. Um, it's a cardigan, so it's worked back and forth, um, but the yoke is all in ribs, so it's the same either side. And then the only bit where you have to work stockinette flat, so knit on the front, pearl on the back, is like a short section in the body. Um, so obviously with cardigans, that's kind of like, well, for me personally, the worst bit is all that purling. Some people really enjoy it. Personally, I'm not so keen on it, but I thought because it's just a small section, that'll be fine. And the thing that attracted me most to the Sunday cardigan, 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 is that it has extra long sleeves, really, really long sleeves, like all the way down to your hand. And I think at the time I was feeling a bit sorry for myself and I just wanted to be like cozy and warm and relaxed. And I just got that vibe from that pattern. So that's another reason why I chose it. I have split the body and I've decided to work the sleeves before the body, um, just in case I don't have enough yarn for the body. I've done the maths a few times and I'm pretty sure I do, though it's, it's difficult to work out, when, especially when patterns are something held with something, but you're using something really different held with something 
else, it can be difficult to work out the yardage sometimes, I find anyway. If there's a magic formula, let me know. Um, so I thought the main thing that I love about this is the long sleeves. So I thought if I do the long sleeves first, I know I've got enough yarn for that. And then if I have to crop the body, then that's also fine. I like a cropped cardigan. My um, Mary cardigan, my green one that I did, I wear all the time. It's probably my most worn knit ever. And I only finished it a month ago. I wear it all the time. Um, and that's reasonably cropped. So I thought, well, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely wear this if it's cropped. I would like it to be a little bit longer if I can, but if it's cropped, it's fine. So there you go. That's my Petite Knit Sunday cardigan. I don't know when I'm going to pick this up again. It's quite a good mindless knit now because I'm just doing like the sleeve is like a, a long puff sleeve, no decreases. So that's pretty mindless now. Um, but I don't know. I think I'm getting more vibes about working on my spark sweater before this. So we'll see. Maybe this will be finished next time. Maybe it won't. I just checked 45 minutes already. This is going to be a long one. Right, let's speed things up a little bit. So I now have some, I mean, they're technically whips, but they're socks. And I've finished one in each pair. So it's like, I mean, I could finish it, but they'd be exactly the same. So is it a half finished object? Is it a whip? Is it an FO? Who knows? First, thing I'm going to show you quickly. I've talked about this loads of times before. This is my latest lovely Anna sock which is my own design the last pair were like green and orange um, and the original pair was like blue and yellow but I um, wanted to do just one more pair firstly because I needed to film the tutorial about how to do the heel and secondly I ended up changing the gauge of the pattern from when I did the first version and I wanted to just double check that one more time. So here's my little lovely Anna Shorty. It's not even been blocked and I haven't even blooming picked up a sock blocker. Bear with. So here you go. My, my sock blockers are too small <laughs> for my foot. I really should get some more. But there you go. You can kind of see it a little bit better there. There's my lovely Anna sock. The test for these is coming to an end this week. I always can't believe it when like you start a test knit. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be so long. I just want to get it over and release now. But then before you know it, you're coming to the end and you're like, oh, I just got to release this pattern now. It's a bit scary. Um, I really, really enjoyed this test knit. I enjoyed the test knit for the corner set socks. But it, for me as a designer, it was quite difficult to keep track of everyone. This time I've made an Instagram group chat and it's been really, really nice. Like being able to talk to all the testers at once, testers talking to each other, everyone helping, encouraging. It's been a really, it's felt like a little, my own little miniature community. Um, so I really, really enjoyed the test knit. The colour combinations, oh my gosh, there's been some incredible ones. And um, one of the testers even did a four colour. This is a three colour. So you've got the Biff Sugar um, Dahlia colorway sock yarn which I've talked about in the last episode and you've got a good old Phil Colon Arvetta in mustard and off-white and I chose those colors because the Biff Sugar has kind of got elements of like a beigey brown and like a lighter pink in it and just like I did with the green and orange pair I took the variegated color picked out the colors in it and then used those as my contrast colors of Bin Laurie so I'm hoping that the test knit comes to an end at the end of this week. I then need to go through all the feedback from my testers. Obviously, one of the good things about the group chat as well is that we can kind of problem solve as we go. And then I don't have to have a long list of edits to make at the end. But I just need to go through and like check um, their yardage and all that kind of stuff. And have a little look at their photos. And then I have to make it pretty because the version I send to my testers is just like a basic like, text version with some pictures. And then all that information gets put into the final pattern. Um, my sister did it for me last time for the corner set socks, but she's told me I need to be a big girl. And I need to learn how to do it myself so that I can do like the process a lot quicker and I'm not so reliant on her. Obviously, if I asked her to, she would do it. But I'm also very aware that like this is her job, this is her time. Um, obviously, with the first one, she was more than happy to help. But I don't want to like take the piss, <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, she's going to teach me how to put it from like a normal basic word file into the proper like fancy InDesign Illustrator program thing like Photoshop but for design. Um, so yeah, that's all going to hopefully happen in the next two weeks. I wanted to get this released by the end of September but I think it might be a little bit longer than that. I'm not too sure. Hopefully, 
by the time I release the next episode. So there you go, that's my latest lovely under sock. I'm gonna stop waving it around. <laughs> oh, somebody said last week that I don't hold things up long enough. I'm really sorry, but I often find that doing this, it doesn't really help anyway. And the way I film is that I cannot see what I, I cannot see myself. If I was to use my forward facing camera, first of all, the quality isn't as good. And second of all, I just end up like looking at myself, which isn't like at the camera. <laughs> and I can some, I sometimes find that quite off putting. Um, it's like if you were talking to someone, but you're just like looking slightly to the left of them, that would be weird, wouldn't it? So that's why I film this way around. So I can't really see what I'm doing. So if I just do this, like I don't really know it's focused or not. So I prefer to talk about the thing and then do cutaways, close ups, like so slow, proper in focus close up so that you can see what I'm talking about. But I will try and be a little bit less wavy. <laughs> so moving on to my final whip. It is another sock and it's a new sock pattern. Um, again, this was in an attempt to kind of like get my mojo back. And this time it finally worked. <laughs> I cast this on, it wasn't yesterday, it was the day before. And I finished my first sock and I'm excited to knit the next one gonna pop it on a blocker here we go now this is a little bit different to my usual Ta -da! this is my new color work sock and I feel like we've gone we've gone up a level in the old color work sock um, game life I don't know if that's me um, but yeah here you go and this sock was 100% fully inspired by the yarn. And I'm going to go into the yarn in a minute, or am I gonna go into the yarn now? I should probably go into the yarn now, actually, because it's kind of, it's where the sock came from. Um, you may have noticed at the beginning of this episode, there was a little paid promotion sticker, and that's because the yarn that I used for this was sent to me for free. There was absolutely no kind of, um, What's the word? I was not asked to talk about it. I was not asked to feature it, um, but I'm gonna because it's exciting. The wonderful Simona from knityarns.co.uk. You've heard me talk about a number of times before. I always buy from her. She's had plenty of my money. She has sent me the new Phil Kalana Alveta colors. If you've been watching me for a while, you will probably know that Arvetta is my favourite sock yarn. I think the colours are amazing and there's even more colours now. I think the price point is great. I think it's really hardy sock and I think it's quite readily available throughout at least Europe and the UK. I'm not sure in America, but it's definitely really accessible to me. And Simona knows how much I love Arvetta and how much I enjoy doing colour work socks. And I ordered some more of um, the um, double Sunday from her because when I first ordered this, I didn't order anywhere near enough. So I popped in another order for some more of that. And in that package, I opened it up and there were these guys. And oh my God, honestly, I don't deserve it. How amazing are these colours? I don't know if these are all the new colours or if these are just some of the new colours. Um, and it doesn't have the name of the colours on, but we've got 827 and 203, and they're both these kind of like browny heathered. One of the things I like about Arvetta is how solid and flat the colour is. So when I'm doing colour work, it's high contrast, it's solid colour, and I love it. And these three are kind of in that vein. You've got 371 hot pink type colour, 318 like a baby pink, and three, seven, two, teal. And these are the two that I've used in my colour work sock. And then these three are slightly more kind of more mild. It's like that kind of thing where it's like the, the, the base, the yarn base is one colour and then they've dyed it over the top um, to get that kind of heathered look. So it's a solid colour, but there's like hints within it. And so I use the grey one, which is nine, seven, eight along with the teal and the hot pink and came up with this bad boy. I did do a little kind of colour work chart on my iPad first, just to kind of make sure it all worked. 
but I don't know why there was something about these colors I kind of just thought I don't know I want something kind of it's almost like Moroccan e isn't I won't say it's Moroccan inspired because I didn't like look at pictures of Moroccan stuff and then design it just kind of came out of my head as I was doodling about on my knitting chart app so this is what it looks like it's not been blocked yet so it's still going to be a little bit bumpy but I decided to do I don't know what this kind of cloth is actually called I'm sure I've heard I think Fernanda from Little Monkeys and Me was talking about this kind of ribbing because she's done it in a, a jumper she's just cast on and she said a name for it I'm sure um but basically you you purl in one color and you knit in the other color and it was definitely fiddly to start off with and it took me a little while to kind of figure out how to get it so from the cast on edge um into the color without kind of getting the bit where you've got like the pearl bump of one color and the legs of another color I basically cast on and then knit what did I do I cast on and then I did one row of one by one color work no purling and then went into the ribbing and there I therefore I got that really nice kind of clean edge and then I just went into the sock it's mostly two by two color work however it's a 14 stitch a 14 row repeat and out of those 14 rows four of them are three color color work however there it's all the same so you've got like five rows and then two rows of three row color work but both those rows are the same and there is some float catching along those three um along those three strand rows but you don't you wouldn't necessarily have to i chose to because it's a sock little toes can get caught on floats quite easily so i'll show you i'll show you my floats i haven't even weaved the ends in i only finished this last night but i didn't want any big floats sticking around when you put your foot in your little toe gets caught so i did do some float catching there but for all the two strand color work there's no float catching i knit this cuff down um doing a finishing with my normal kind of wedge toe um and this time i didn't do an afterthought heel <gasps> can you imagine me not doing an afterthought heel <laughs> basically to do an afterthought heel i would have had to have really interrupted the color work and i didn't really want that to happen so i decided to do a little bit more research into um short row heels like with this one this is a german short row heel and I kind of get gaps between each short row and I find that quite annoying so I wanted to do something that I could knit within the sock but didn't have gaps along here and obviously it didn't take me long but I, I came across the shadow wrap heel which I've seen a number of times before but hadn't really looked into and it oh my god it's fantastic. I understand why everyone's raving about it now. You get the short row heel, but without all the gaps along along here. And when I say gaps, you quite often get holes either side of your heels, and you get those with afterthought heels, though I use different techniques to close them. Um, but when I'm talking about gaps in the heel, I'm talking about along here. So you basically, you work in your sock, and then you knit the first half of your heel back and forth, doing short rows as you go, and then you kind of basically knit down the other way, closing the short rows as you go, and then you carry on with the leg of your sock. And I wanted something where I could, um, technically the colour work goes into the heel just a little bit, but what it means is I can, I can put that heel in between that colour work, but still get my lovely kind of edges. And it is a little bit tricky, it does involve kind of breaking your yarn and rejoining it a little bit, but nothing like major. And one of the best things about this heel is you do not get holes either side. You just don't. It's brilliant. Like, no hole closing whatsoever. I did go in with some of my ends and reinforce this area anyway, which I would always recommend, even if you don't have holes. Because if you think about when you're wearing a sock... This is where you get a lot of pull and a lot of kind of um, tension. So it's always good to kind of reinforce this area with a little bit of weaving in any way. But I'm really, really pleased with the result. It does need a little bit of tweaking. I've got a bit of an issue around here where the colour work kind of, 
I basically, I did a blue stitch when it should have been a grey stitch, but that's just like, that's just me and my perfectionism. Um, but I'm really, really pleased with the way it worked out. I wasn't sure whether the shadow wrap heel was intellectual property or not. Obviously, like, general heel techniques, they're like, they're free for all. They're not owned by anyone. They've been around for a very, very long time. But I wasn't sure whether the whole shadow wrap thing was somebody's property. Um, when you look for shadow wrap heel, you will most likely be taken to the Earth, Tone, Earth Tones Girl um, podcast blog. Her name is Denise. She's got a whole series called Socksploration, and it's all, all about making socks takes all the different techniques down to really fine detail and teaches you about it not just how to do it but about it as well and that's where i learned to do i used that technique for this so when i finished the sock i thought hang on a minute have i used something that's like someone's intellectual property here can i then put this in my pattern and sell that pattern or am i like taking somebody's work so i put it on my instagram and loads of people came back to me saying no it's not intellectual property it's a well-known technique i've been doing it for years and years and years before it was even called shadow wrap so then I thought, is the term shadow wrap, does that belong to um, Denise? I just wasn't sure. So in the end, just messaged Denise and she got back to me so, so quickly. And not only did she say, no, it's absolutely fine, you can use it, but she also explained to me what is classed as intellectual property and what isn't and basically where the lines blur. So I'm really, really thankful to Denise for helping me out there. Um, and I'm super excited because it means I can use this awesome, awesome technique. And I think if I do use this, if I do get to the point where I release this pattern, I won't bother making my own tutorial for this. I'll just direct people straight to her tutorial because it's fantastic. Um, like it doesn't mean I, I wouldn't need to like make it again. I think with the other tutorials that I've made, it's because I've kind of, not that I've done it slightly differently, but I like to be able to explain how to do the afterthought heel in the context of the corner set sock. I like to show how to do the peasant heel, which is this one in the context of the lovely Anna sock so that when people are following my pattern, they can go and see it being done on that specific pattern. Because it's not always easy to watch a tutorial and then insert it into a different pattern. But in this case, I think it would work. So there we go. There's my new sock pattern. I have a name for it and I'm going to share it because th it could only be this name it has to be this name this is the Simona sock how could it not it was completely inspired by the yarn that was sent to me from the lovely Simona so I had to name the sock after her didn't I so there you go there's the Simona sock that's my new colour work pattern um I am going to start a new pair but not in these colours although I don't know I was knitting on these last night and I just wasn't feeling the colours, but obviously it was quite a bit darker. But seeing them in the daylight, I actually think they're really, really fun. And I think I did make the right choice. So I'm probably going to continue with this pair. And then once the um, lovely Anna socks have been released, I will move on to the new test call for these. But it kind of depends on how I get along with my colour work jumper. I think potentially we will be doing test calls alongside because these are quite different. The test for this will probably only be four weeks because it's a pair of socks. It doesn't take too long, especially if you're used to colour work socks. Um, but for this, it will probably be a little bit longer, especially for the larger sizes of the child's garment. But I'm quite keen to get this on the go now because it's a jumper. We want to be able to knit it for winter, don't we? So even if I did the test call for this tomorrow, it would still be probably two months before the pattern's ready, so we need to get shifty on with this, but I don't want to hold it up with these, so I'll probably do them at the same time. I am rambly as you like today. So there you go, that's all my projects that I'm working on and a little bit of yarn appreciation for you. I do have one more acquisition, which I'm going to share with you quickly, and it's the other yarn I got from um, So You Can Knit. Whilst we're talking about that, just so you know, So You Can Knit also has a website that you can buy from. Um, so if you are in the UK, have a little look. It is a an absolute treasure trove. That's the word. It's a treasure trove. So my other main acquisition is the Sky. I have been looking at this yarn online for ages. I've always been really intrigued by it. It's West Yorkshire Spinners, but it's a col I don't know if it's a collaboration, but it is Shetland wool. 
It's 100% Shetland Island wool, and this is their kind of like tweedy version. You can get this in solid colours as well, but this one is called Copister 796. And the reason I hadn't bought it before is every time I'd found it online, this shade was always like sold out or there wasn't enough in stock. But I was really, really drawn to it. And when I walked into So You Can Knit, I was like, oh, and I could see it hanging up. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to look at everything else. But I think I know what I'm going home with today. <laughs> I bought six skeins of it. My intention for this is the Tulip Sweater by Melody Hoffman. I've recently seen Sian from the Obsessive Knitter and Jules from So Sweet Violet have both knit a Tulip Sweater and they both did a pink one, slightly different pinks. But I just was like, mm, that is one for me. It's a really simple raglan, I think, sweater. It can, it comes in kind of like different eases. So you can have it tight, you can have it loose, you can have it long, you can have it cropped. But the main feature of it is the ribbed edge has like a scallop to it. And it's done using short rows as far as I'm aware. And it's just gorgeous. It's one of those that would look really nice over high-waisted trousers or even over a dress. And um, it's kind of got a similar kind of vibe to it, to the Felix really, just a really simple, but it's got that one little detail, like with the Felix, it's got the kind of, um, the lace work on the raglan, just that one little thing that kind of separates it from the rest. And I think it's really, um, really classy and really, really lovely. So that's what this is gonna be. I have been ever so good, I'm ever so prepared. I have um, wound up one skein because it's quite tricky sometimes to see what it looks like when it's in the skein versus when it's wound up into a cake. And I have swatched, woo <laughs> Look at me go, aren't I good? Um, and so I used the recommended needles for the tulip pattern and I got gauge perfectly. And you can kind of see, I mean, I don't know how well you can see because you can never really translate the colors of things properly from real life through a camera and then through a screen. But what you get with this kind of, it's basically like red, white, red, white, red, white. But what you get overall is kind of like a pink vibe, like a dark, I'd say it's like raspberry. And you can see kind of speckles of brighter red and speckles of darker red, but you get a very kind of even color. If you've seen any of my episodes before, I realize I'm starting to say that quite a lot. You'll know my relationship with hand dyed yarn has been a little bit mm, with pooling and having to like alternate skeins and stuff. And that is still something I want to explore. I've got some beautiful hand dyed yarn that is ready to go. I've just kind of got to work myself up to it. But I thought with this more commercial yarn, you get that kind of hand dyed vibe, but the consistency across skeins is a little bit more reliable, I think, I hope. Also, because this isn't kind of like, you know, when you get the hand dyed yarns, it's got like a big section of white and then you'll get a big section of colour and that's what creates the pooling. This is definitely more, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing this because you're not going to be able to see, but of course there will be cutaways. This is definitely more of like a, a condensed speckle. Do I sound like I know what I'm talking about? I don't think like it. But anyway, yes, yeah, so this is going to be tulip. That's what that's going to be. Haven't had the urge to cast it on, I think because obviously I've got a fair amount of sweaters on the go. Um, when all my sweaters are kind of like done and clear and I want to be a bit more mindless, that's probably what I will work on. So there you go. I think that's, um, oh, I for I've forgotten. I've got another acquisition to show you that was definitely inspired by my um, lack of knitting mojo. Um, but before I do, I'm just gonna show you one cheeky little thing. Um, on my sister's birthday, after we'd been for tea and we'd been to the yarn shop, we went back to my mum's. My mum's got a hot tub, so we quite often, me and my mum and my sister will meet up and go in the hot tub. But when we, one of the presents I got for my sister was I got her a book um, about granny squares, but they were like all white. There was like hundred, I don't know if there was a hundred, but there were loads of different designs. And basically within the book, it also showed you how to turn them into your own designs. And my sister's an incredible crocheter. I can't, when I watch you do it, I just, it must be how people feel when they watch, watch me knit, they just can't compute what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but we decided to 
go through my mum stash and all knit a granny square. Um, and my sister let me choose because I was like, I have crocheted in the past. I've done a baby blanket, um, but it never really kind of captured me. Um, my sister let me choose and look what I made. I did a granny square with, with crochet. <laughs> um, I have no idea what the yarn is. I think it's a sheep years. Um, I know I'm saying that wrong yarn. Um, but yeah, my sister said that I didn't choose something easy to start off with. Um, but actually it's kind of like a baptism of fire, isn't it? Just go, go hard or go home basically. Um, and we all did one of these. We all chose different colors. I'll pop in a little picture of our three different ones together. And it was such a lovely way to spend a few hours with my mum and my sister doing something new. My mum and my sister had so much knowledge between them. They were able to really guide me through and I really enjoyed it. And from doing this, we kind of got the idea, hang on a minute, we should make a blanket together as like a threesome and then whoever lives the longest gets to keep it i mean i'm the youngest so it might be me <laughs> but um we just thought it would be a really nice thing to do so what we're going to do is we're going to go and choose some yarn all in a similar color family and then just do a big granny square blanket where we would just do different granny squares but all in the same kind of color family so it looks cohesive and looks intentional but it's like a group effort. So I don't know how it's going to work because obviously my tension is very different to my mum and my sister's because they're so well practised. But in the end, it's just going to be, you know, a family blanket heirloom of love. And then, you know, whichever one of us lives the longest can pass it down to our grandchildren. We just thought that would be a nice thing to do. So that's that random little thing. <laughs> As my sister says, you've come over to the dark side. <laughs> But no, I haven't fully gone over to the dark side. There will be more crochet in my future, but I am definitely a knitter at heart. <laughs> I don't think there's any, I mean, obviously I think there's quite a lot of um, people assume that there's snobbery when it comes to knitters and crocheters. But for me, I just think they're so completely different. Obviously they're in a similar craft family, but the techniques and the skills it takes to do crochet, I think are quite different to knitting. And I don't think crochet or knitting, either one is either better than the other. I think they just appeal to different parts of the brain. Therefore, whatever kind of person you are, you might find them either one more appealing. Um, I'm going to hopefully see if I can teach my mum and my sister to knit something. It's quite strange because it's like, you can't just like, I mean, I guess you could knit up a granny square, but... I don't know how enjoyable that would be. I think I'd quite like to teach them to knit a hat, maybe a chunky weight hat. So I'll be teaching them to knit in a round, which is a big thing. I'm always like, just start within the round, just start, start as you need to go on kind of thing. So maybe like a, a really simple little beanie they could do, maybe, who knows? Anyway, let's move on, because this is getting long. My final acquisition. Now this is a little bit of a surprise, and this was my kind of last ditch attempt to get myself out of my rut and bring back my knitting mojo i don't know why i feel so like Ooh, about it but i've done something it's very very out of character um way back episode two and three i tried to knit a shawl and i cast it on gave it a go and ripped it back and turned it into something else because it just wasn't lighting my fire so I was sitting on my phone the other day, wasn't knitting, scrolling through Instagram, and it might not be that difficult to guess what I came across because it's all everyone is talking about at the moment. The Stephen West Mystery Cal. It happens every year. Last year it was, I think it was the Slip Stravaganza. This year it's called Shawlography. And I bought yarn and I bought the pattern, and I'm going to be doing the MCAL for a shawl, and I don't like shawls. <laughs> I don't really know what I was thinking. I was think I was thinking, I'm sick of jumpers, I'm sick of socks, I need something different. And even though shawls aren't necessarily my thing, something about it being a mystery really appealed to me. I love the idea of not knowing what was happening. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a go. If I don't enjoy it, and I don't want to continue with it, I don't have to. It's it's my craft. I make up the rules. 
Um, but also just to kind of make sure I didn't end up kind of working on something that I wasn't enjoying, I decided to go with a really affordable yarn. I looked at all the kits and they look amazing, but oh my God, they're expensive. And if you love shawls with all your heart, then I would, I would, if I was that person, I'd be buying that incredible yarn. I know that Stephen West, and um, they have that shop, Stephen and Penelope, they've made their own kits and different yarns and stuff. And loads of all the indie dyes are doing kits as well. But I thought I'm just gonna go with a really simple, affordable yarn. So if I don't finish it, one, I'm not massively out of pocket. Two, I can use it for something else. So like colour work, jumper for the kids or something. So I had a little look on Wool Warehouse and I think the yarn that Stephen suggests it's alpaca and wool. I think it's either alpaca merino mix or an alpaca wool mix. So I thought I need, I want to choose something that's along those lines so that my finished shawl is like true to what it's supposed to be. And after some very quick research, I found the drops Nord. It's a four ply yarn. It is 45% alpaca. 25% wool and 30% polyamide. Obviously that polyamide content is gonna bring the price down, but it's still got that, um, it's still mainly alpaca, so it should still should have that same drape and that same softness. It's got ever such a slight kind of fuzz to it, but not a huge amount. And for the cowl, you need five different contrasting colors. And so another thing I thought I could do to help myself be motivated by this is choose colors that I love. So we are getting into autumn, it's coming to the end of September, so I decided to go with all the rusty, orangey, browny, warmy colours. So I've got, bear with, I've got my little receipt here that's got all the names on it. So we've got um, light beige mix, so this is kind of like, you need 100 grams of every colour apparently. Um, this is kind of like a greyish, brownish, I mean it's beige but I definitely think it leans a little bit more towards grey so that's my kind of neutral colour. I then wanted a brown so we've gone for chestnut and it's it, it's a brown colour what can I say it's quite a kind of cool brown actually I thought it might be a little bit warmer but I like that it offers a coolness as it's kind of like a nice bridge from the really cool slightly warmer to the really really warm. Oh this one this is rust this is rust mix and again it's got that slightly kind of heathered look to it it's mainly an orange but you can see there's kind of like elements of yellow in there underneath and then i decided to transfer over to golden rod so you can kind of see where i'm going with this you can kind of see the progression it's a kind of similar tone but they're all different colors and they are all quite different they should contrast whichever two are next to each other because you don't really know there should be a strong enough contrast and then i needed a fifth color so i decided to just go completely random and throw in a pink <laughs> this is old pink and it's a little bit similar here and a little bit similar here but within like all the information you get for the cow it says you can kind of go for more of a, a similar kind of color tone but then the kind of different stitch patterns will be less clear but that's also okay so i think i've got a pretty good mix and they arrived this morning and i'm really really excited about these colors i don't know if i will wear the finished shawl but my kind of favorite winter coat i've got like a, a camel a tan camel long wool coat and i just think these will look really really lovely against that coat because let's be honest i don't think i'll be wearing a shawl kind of day to day i mean who knows I'm much more likely to wear it like as a scarf when I go out. So that's what I thought. So I think I'm on track to maybe potentially finishing this shawl. I have knit two shawls before. I've done, oh gosh, I can't remember what it was called or who it was by. It was by Tammy Gore, I think. And it was like a, a brown and white lacy bobble shawl that I knit for my mum. And I've also done the Fibre Tales Humley Bee shawl, but they were both for other people. And I was much more motivated to finish those. I really enjoyed the homily bee, actually. It was mainly garter stitch and that beautiful little bee pattern. I really enjoyed knitting that, but I think that was because it was for somebody else and I was so confident they were going to love it. So my mother-in-law, she loves bees and she, I just knew that she would probably get a lot more wear out of a, a, a scarf type shawl than I would. So hopefully I will be finishing this 
let me see. Right, we've got just a little bit of kind of nitty chat and admin to uh, do. First of all, I'm going to talk about my little cow that's going on. I mentioned it last week. Me and the glorious Marina from Strawberry Patches podcast have come together to, to bring you a cow. It is called the Strawberry Pickle Cow. I oh, thank you. Um, and it's all about celebrating the joy of four ply yarn. It started on the 1st of September. I am hosting over on Instagram and Marina is hosting over on Ravelry. And she is drawing from finished objects. And I think she's doing one draw at the end of the cow. It's running right up until the end of October. And I will be drawing from Instagram and I'm drawing from um whips so no matter what stage you're at you've got a good chance of winning a prize and I, I can't believe that there are already so many entries to it i've obviously got that huge imposter syndrome thing when it's like nobody's going to enter the cow why would they <laughs> but i'm so pleasantly surprised to see loads of different projects we've got socks we've got shawls we've even got jumpers and it's like so so inspiring to see everybody's different work so i will be drawing my first two winners at the end of september it's the 22nd today, so in about a week's time, I will be drawing a digital prize and a physical prize. I discussed this all in the last episode, so if you want even more details on it, go and check out the end of the last episode. There are timestamps and everything, so you don't have to like scroll through, you can just skip to the point, like the nitty chat at the end. Um, so there will be a skein of yarn and a pattern going to two lucky winners, and I'll be drawing that from Instagram. So if you haven't yet joined the cow, Pop over to Instagram if you have an Instagram account and just share a post using the um, strawberry pickle curl hashtag so that I can see it and get that entry in there before the end of the month because I will be drawing and I will be sharing the winners in the next podcast as well. But obviously I will let the winners know when I draw. So that's a little bit of um, cow admin for you. Um, I might pop a couple of pictures in as well, but I'll have to double check and get permission first, I think. Um, next up is... What has been tickling my knitting pickle this episode? And you can probably guess, but the answer is nothing. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that my pickle hasn't been tickled. I've been in a major rut. I've lost my mojo and I think that's okay. But please do let me know if anything has been tickling your knitting pickle, if you've found a new pattern or new yarn that you absolutely love. Speaking of new yarn, I would also want to mention that last week I asked you to recommend your local UK um, environmentally conscious yarn producers for um, a viewer that sent me a message. Thank you so, so much for all your suggestions. Oh my God, they're like, it's so exciting how many different brands are out there. I have messaged her since and let her know your suggestions, but also said, go and have a little look through the comments. I think the ones that were most commonly suggested were John Arben, oh my gosh, how could I have forgotten John Arben? Love, love, love that yarn. And of course it's British, it's local, and it's um, environmentally conscious. But then there was also Garth Nor. I've not used their yarn before, but I know um, young Jonathan talks about it a lot. So um, I'd like to have a look into that yarn again soon. And also of course, Woolly Mammoth. I don't know if you've seen the Woolly Mammoth podcast, but um, Emma is a, a uh, dyer based in Northern Ireland. She tries to, she uses local yarn. It's all naturally hand dyed. So that's another, another great one. So thank you for all your yarny suggestions. Really appreciate it. And then um, I haven't got a podcast to recommend, mainly because since when we were being poorly, I've not really been watching podcasts. Oh my gosh, my um, subscription feed, I've got so, so many. I think every podcast that I'm subscribed to has released an episode <laughs> and I've got so much to catch up on. So I'm really, really excited. But that also means I haven't really gone down that path and explored any new ones. So I would really, really appreciate it if this week you could let me know your favourite podcaster. Um, just let me know one per person, otherwise it, it, it'll probably be too much. But if you could let me know which podcaster you get so excited to watch every time their the new episode comes out. Let me know so that I can have a little look and find some new um, podcasts to watch and then to recommend next week. Next week, next episode. And then Designer Spotlight. I have a special one for you, actually. I was contacted by this designer, the lovely Debbie May. She messaged me on Instagram she watches the podcast, hello Debbie, and she asked if I would have a little look at her new pattern. I was like, oh 
very honored to have a little look at that. Um, she has got, I think it's five jumper patterns and a cushion, I believe, I'll have her at the moment. So she is very, very, very small. And the pattern that she sent me to have a look at was called Dandelion Dreams. And oh my gosh, it's incredible. It's um, a top down yoke as far as I'm aware. And it has beads in it. And I've seen bead knitting so many times, but I've never seen anything that kind of captured me and thought, oh, I actually would like to knit that and have a go at doing the beads. And it's just this really beautiful, I think it's got mohair in it, but anyway, it's definitely got a very light, fluffy vibe. And there's this really beautiful, subtle, classy yoke design that involves beads. And she's got another um, yoke sweater as well called the Furbelo Pullover. And it's similar to the Dandelion Dreams. It's kind of got this yoke detail with lines. But again, it's just subtle and classy and just really, really different to anything I've seen recently. So I really, I thought it would be a really good idea to share her designs with you guys today. Again, her name is Debbie Mage. All the details will be in the description box below. And when I said to her, yes, of course, I'd love to um, share your designs on the podcast. She ever so kindly offered a discount code. Isn't that lovely? So you can use the code PICKLE15 for 15% 15 off any of her designs over on Ravelry. And that runs until the 15th of October. So again, I'll put the link and all the details in the description box below. But that's my little small designer spotlight this episode. And please do let me know your suggestions, of course. I personally find it really, really helpful to have all your comments and um, all your suggestions. Um, and I hope you guys as viewers have a little look through the comments as well, if you ever need some inspiration. So there we go. I think that brings us to the end of this probably really long episode. Episode nine was like the longest so far. I think it was like an hour and 20 and I'm pretty sure this one will be longer as well. So thank you so much for joining me on this lovely sunny September day. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you again next time.